Hi, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a pro professor of chemistry at the School of Molecular Sciences. So we're making this video today, Vladi, to look at um, this uh, book has a nice introductory chapter that it's just called the fundamentals. So it, they start chapter one with, you know, the first law and then move on to uh, kind of biological thermodynamics. But they have a chapter in front of chapter one, which is called a fundamentals chapter, where they kind of try to summarize some of the um, so key point lessons that they would have learned in introductory chemistry mainly, a few things out of physics, but mostly things they would have seen in, in their introductory chemistry course, which you would say is the one uh, prerequisite that is most relevant to what they're gonna be, what we're gonna be building on this semester is concepts that they first saw in their introductory, typically two semester uh, chemistry course where they first saw thermochemistry, where they first saw um, phase equilibria, electrochemistry, and we're going to build those in molecular direction and in, uh, you know, more skewed towards biological systems this semester. And uh, hence, uh, one of the questions I found, um, you know, as a really good jumping off point from this fundamentals um, chapter was the following, which is question five out of fundamentals, which is explain the difference between gases, liquids, and solids at both kind of a macroscopic and a microscopic level. And I've grabbed a couple uh, figures that kind of try, in fact, you know, these are popular figures because of just they're trying to do both at the same time. They're trying to give you a sense at the microscopic scale through drawing kind of ball stick diagrams of, in this case, water um, uh, versus, you know, a macroscopic, you know, picture as well. But you know, this solid looks like benzene. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? They, yeah. they take the hexagonal ice, you know, way too, uh, right? Like they love to just show the hexagon uh, nature, you know, of the of hexagonal uh, ice, you know, in this. Um, so. But it's not. Huh? It's not. Um, and in such a case, the gas phase would be benzene molecules, but they are water molecules. Yeah, yeah. I see. Um, so, but so, you're right. It looks like, you know, I can tell, like, just because it has, you know, the two protons uh, there instead of just, right. you know, the one it would have. Uh, if it was benzene, and there, it looks almost like they were trying to, if you put no protons there at all, it would have been a graphene you know, lattice that looks like they really kind of grabbed that from. Yeah. Uh, and what they didn't get, or it's not very obvious from what they're kind of showing, is, is what makes a lot of these, which is the, the intermolecular hydrogen bonds that really give hexagonal ice, you know, um, a lot right. of the uh, bonding properties yeah. that it has in the solid phase. Uh, yeah, you know that there is an uh, initial reflection on all this from the microscopic. I mean, you see microscopic point of view and macroscopic and microscopic point of view. So now we know, or I mean, we we haven't looked into that, but uh, somehow the students know, and um, we of course are supposed to know that that the, the fundamental equation that describes matter at the microscopic level is Schrodinger equation. Now, when we are solving from Schrodinger equation, the only information we need is the number of electrons and the number of nuclei in that. And then we have the equation. Then we solve it. So now question, when we solve that equation, do we get solid gases or liquids? And the answer is that we don't. I mean, you just solve your equation, and you put the exact equation, and you find states, which are the solutions of this equation, which do not correspond to any of this. And the question is, so what's going on here? Because we thought that this was the fundamental equation. You solve it, and you don't get, you get something that to some extent is similar to a gas, but not even that. So the que then the question is, so how do we understand this difference at the microscopic level? Because the fundamental equation doesn't give us this. So we, we, we talk about that in a, in, a, in a minute, but just so that we understand that um, if, we, if we want really to, to obtain, you know, solutions that look like a solid, a gas and a liquid, we have to inform the equation that we are looking for the solution where the nuclei are somewhere. 
in the approximate geometries that corresponds to either the solid, the gas, and the liquid. And then we get the states we're looking for. So we have to break the symmetry, the, the technical term. We have to break the symmetry and then tell Schrodinger equation, the, we are looking for solutions where the nuclei are in these approximate positions. And then you get a solid, you get whatever. So it's, right. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, let's start with what I would say. I think where we probably want to spend uh, most of our time is, is, you know, in this class anyway, is one of the big goals is to give a more microscopic, you know, intuition and conceptual understanding. I mean, that's often what we're trying to do as chemists, right? Or, or biochemists is to get towards a molecular level. I mean, it's the reason we're in a school for molecular sciences. Um, but, you know, starting at the macroscopic, you would say, you know, these are things that you know, you, you students already have an intuition for, you know, that, that solids, you know, hold their shape. And so, you know, a lot of times uh, people start with the very macroscopic idea of just its volume and its shape, you know, that a solid more or less, um, you know, to first approximation, the things that, that uh, make it, that, that constitute that solid don't move, don't diffuse in any reasonable time scale so that, you know, what it, wherever it is in space, it stays there, you know. Um, while liquids are where you allow those intermolecular interactions to now loosen enough where, you know, things move around and they can take the shape of the vessel they're in. And then if you remove those interactions even further, then they will take the volume of the, you know, place they're in instead. Yeah. And again, trying to, to make it a little bit more complicated. You see, the There the is main, like to complicate simple things, right? The, like the, that, that's main, like your job, I think, you know. <laughs> The main, physically, the main driving force to take you from a solid to a gas, from a gas to a liquid, is temperature. It could be pressure too, but let's say temperature, because this is the, our familiar intuition. Right. Now, when we look at matter around us, the density of matter around us is typically one gram per cubic centimeter. Probably, yeah, yeah. But variation. We're there. so used to right. Um, uh, yeah, we're so used to water. Right, type. right. But, but most organics are ten or twenty percent right. of water. Now, if we go into out, outer space, then we might find objects where, let's say, stars, neutron stars, or even black holes, which are. It's matter, but it's, it's matter that has been compressed to a, to a degree that we cannot imagine that. For instance, to get what, to, what is called to the gravitational radius of Earth, you will have to compress Earth to one centimeter. So instead of the several million, you know, right. centimeters that you have, you have to compress to one. But it's still matter. Right. But you can't almost fathom, I mean, like you said, to bring nuclei that, I mean, we can't even fathom those type of energies or pressures, exactly. et cetera, because pressure in solid matter, in liquids or, or solid, I mean, goes up so fast. You have to decrease volume such a small amount to increase pressure, you know, huge, huge amounts. Or, or maybe a simpler way of putting it is you have to put a ton of freaking force on something to compress a solid at all. Right. You know? and, and what is the explanation for that? that electrons do not like to be compressed. Because electrons, they are- Well, the, theorists is, love is, to start is, by treating everything as just an electron exactly, gas, right? Exactly, like that's, exactly. that, that's the starting point because for- Because electrons, electrons, in addition to having electric charge, there is something called in quantum mechanics, the Pauli principle. So they don't like to be compressed because the energy increases hugely. So the main culprit why is so difficult to compress electrons. A solid is because electrons do not like to be compressed. I, energetically, I mean, it's, right. it's just a, a, a human anthropomorphic way of saying that, but it, they, it's quantum mechanics. So everything, I mean, thermodynamics actually, and this is another important point, thermodynamics was developed without having, having any idea whatsoever about the structure of matter. Thermodynamics was developed, let's say, 200 years ago. And at that time, scientists and people, they didn't, they didn't even know that molecules of atoms exist at all. And nevertheless, thermodynamics is okay. So, so in thermodynamics, we don't need this microscopic description. Of course, 
Once you have it, it helps you a lot to understand the behavior of thermodynamic system, but you don't need it to, to come up with the fundamental ideas of thermodynamics. Einstein was the, the, the one who said that, that when he thinks about something that's going to be there forever, in scientific terms, he thinks about thermodynamics because it doesn't depend on any model. Yeah, yeah, no yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember uh, that quote where, yeah, if he had to bet on one thing that's still going to be here long after he's gone, there's no doubt, you know, uh, that thermodynamics. And I know Feynman, uh, you know, has another famous quote about, you know, if you only one thing you could leave behind, you know, that the next, the, the, you know, the next generation forgot everything that we've learned to date, you can only pass on one thing, it would be the molecular theory, you know, that where we get as far as, you know, yes, is there something beneath atoms, be, be, you know, beyond just nuclei or neutrons, protons and electrons? Yes, there is. But you get a hell of a lot out of knowing just that, you know, yeah. and that is a huge step forward, which is exactly takes us to this, you know, microscopic level, which is where you've been driving things, which is really it's at the microscopic level that we're going to spend a lot of time this semester, which is kind of funny. It's ironic, right? We're, we're spending the whole semester teaching the macroscopic theory of you know, physical chemistry theory mm -hmm. for biochemists. It's a, you know, thermodynamics. It's the theory of the macroscopic. But so often, you know, one of our main things in teaching it that would be different than how engineering would teach it or others is we do focus a lot, in a sense, on the statistical mechanics or the molecular nature that this is, uh, that's underpinning this. Right. Now, one of my favorite examples is where... Let's... Let's Where move we need. to this one. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, of course, this is phase transition. But you see, in biology, there is a, a, a particular phenomenon that is purely mic microscopic and it has a huge influence on us, mutations. Mutation is a quantum, it's a quantum event. That's why it's st stochastic. The, 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 you cannot control it. So it was science, I think, a, a year ago, they had an article about cancer saying that the main, because we think of cancer, say, so you, you eat this and that, you don't exercise, you are fat, whatever, well, you are not fat, but, you know. But then it turns out that the, the main ma uh, molecular culprit is randomness. Right. And you cannot control that. Of course, then it comes well, the question. In fact, they, they purposely do this, right? Like famous, you know, everyone doesn't like to talk about uh, genetically modified organisms, GMOs, um, even though we've been, you know, whether you do it directed or you let, you know, time, you know, every, every crop, if you look at 5,000 years ago versus what we eat today, everything's been genetically modified. It's just, we, we allowed it to do it in more natural. But one of the things that's really common is to use radiation, is to use uh, radioactive things to cause mutation, random right. mutations, uh -huh. you know, and to do it, you know, because they will known to cause gene mutation problems and to get plants that, you know, recycle those faster so that you can start looking for things you want to selectively, uh, you know, but, ran but selectively but randomly, right. you know, um, pull out. You know, it's always out of random populations, though, you know. Yeah, but then we know that uh, if exposure to radiation is high, then the, the biological organism is dead no matter what. So because yeah. you, are, you are inducing a rate of mutation that is incompatible with life. You know. But Schrodinger's really, cat would yeah. beg to differ whether it's alive or yeah. dead. You know, it could, you know, so. Um, Okay, so uh, you, have you noticed here they love to draw that hexagon again? Yeah. You know, uh, I actually really like their little um, the phase diagram thing here, though, where we're, you know, in a lot of times, a lot of books or physical chemists, uh, theorists uh, uh, get, you know, wrongfully, you know, uh, criticized for taking everything back to just billiard balls, right? Like, um, but, you know, oftentimes I find it really interesting to move from something like what do things look at at the molecular level when you're dealing with molecules, like in this case water is such a common one to look at, or, or CO2 or just something we're kind of familiar with at the molecular level, but also to take it back to something like what we would say, you know, chemically would be like a, you know, a, a noble gas or argon, something that can be treated in kind of a very billiard ball, 
like fashion. And you know, whether you call it colloidal science or whether you, I mean, it has driven a lot of our understanding in phase equilibria and other things. And as you go from the nano world to the macro world, as you go through these kind of colloidal, you know, that intermediate link scale in really understanding that, you know, you can think of, you know, Chris or solids as having translational symmetry. You can think of liquids by its kind of free volume or ability to diffuse and go past each other and, and how these differ in their intermolecular uh, structure and how those can even kind of spill over to something that's somewhat, you know, continuous between these to something that where we really spread these up and there's no intermolecular interactions in a gas and it becomes more ideal as you separate those further and further, you know. Yeah. And no, it's uh, again, it's interesting to, to realize that if you are here or there or there, if you take two water molecules and you ask, how does the interaction between these two water molecules look like? Then you have an answer. It, it depends on the, on the distance between atoms and it depends on the on the dipole the charges it depends right. on several things but the point is that here here and here these interactions between two water models are going to be the same the problem the difference is that the temperature but that's temperature. why I think people love to go to this because here, like you pointed out, it, it, it's only a distance, but geometry plays such a big role. You know, you have to look at it from every angle while spheres get rid of that, you know, having to look at the geometric problem and get you to just being able to look at a radial problem between things. Right. Yeah. But then you also realize that when you look at these specific things, then the energy that is available for each atom depends dramatically on temperature because it regulates the kinetic energy. Right. It doesn't influence that much the potential energy, but it does regulate the kinetic energy. And so, so the main difference between here and here and here is how much kinetic energy on average Right. Well, it's atom. another reason I like to go between these two types of models, ones where you can treat them as, you know, hard spheres where you only have kinetic you know, energy terms to worry about or and you can precisely versus ones where you have internal potentials, you know, that, that change, which have a whole different. I mean, th they make things more complicated very quick in where that energy can dissipate and go into and and stuff like that. When you start getting vibrational degrees of freedom and and rotational degrees of freedom that, that can play roles in some of these, it, it really kind of helps you separate out the different degrees of freedom and how they can play a role in changing energy and potential and the potentials they can have you know right so. and so again this, these two descriptions these two views they also have the, this is extremely important well we haven't talked about statistics but the the fact is that it is only when you are describing systems with a large number of particles if you are just looking at one atom then thermodynamics in principle doesn't make any sense. Or it makes sense only when you put that atom in contact with something that is large. Right. Other than, other than that, so the, 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 the way these two concepts interact or enter into the physical description is what the, the purpose of statistical mechanics. Right. And in, well, and there's such beautiful examples. Being able to start with, you know, one of the classic things you learn in quantum mechanics like a particle in a box and be able to then statistically take that up to showing when there's no potential and no interaction between them that you can in three dimensions in a three dimensional particle in a box you can statistic churn statistical mechanics of those non interacting things and get an ideal gas equation out you know and that you can do you know is you know um, I think incredibly powerful to see for the first time yeah I, I, absolutely and that, and this is the way for instance can I yeah for it yeah, four. I mean, if you go, let's say, a gas, then you have an ideal gas. Ideal gas, the interaction between molecules, this interaction is zero. You go to a van der Waals gas, then the interaction between these two molecules is not zero. And then by doing a statistical mechanics, you understand that if you do this, you get an equation of state that is, looks like this, PV equal to NR, N, 
RT. And RT. And if you go here, you get something that depends on the size of the molecule and the interaction of the molecule. Right. So there is a... And how you do those potentials between them dictates from something very simple where it has just some induced dipole, you know, or Van der Waals type, <laughs> Van der Waals gas. Of course it would have Van der Waals interactions, you know. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, some induced dipole type uh, London uh, forces uh, versus more complicated things, you know, or what dictate the different, you know, gas equations of state that get towards different levels of approximation. And, right. Uh, so, so, so that they give you a different view again. <clears throat> well, and a good example right here is right an ideal gas. Given especially what we were just talking about, an ideal gas. So, is here. Can an ideal gas ever become, you know, a liquid? No. Right, no. like you can just keep compressing it to infinite, you know. They, so it only, you know, makes sense in a in, in a kind of a limit, in a limit of very low pressure, very in a sense far apart molecules where you don't expect interaction, right? And um, Van der Waals, though, you can go to a they, place they do where show it condenses. Yeah, it yeah. it can condense, um, you know, to a liquid state, you know. Yeah. And in fact, they've even used these Van der Waals potentials. Um, to show that you can even get, in some cases, that they with some slight modifications in the liquid Close state. Close to the you, solid transition. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So, okay. Well, uh, hopefully, uh, this discussion w helps students with kind of looking at, at this and, and seeing how rich of an area this is, looking between uh, gases, liquids, and solids. And to think that all three aren't important in for biology is is ridiculous, right? I mean, all three phases of matter and kind of understanding both from a macroscopic perspective and a molecular uh, perspective to get some intuition with what happens when things, you know, form CO2 and form gases and why does it have a greenhouse a effect and why, you know, these have huge important things, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. uh, we, we, could, we could talk this about- This year in Nobel Prize, how, how cancer cells trick the immune system this is a molecular problem. Yeah. And does it have implications for biology? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>